Welcome to my presentation. My name is Dr. Tushar Mehta, and I will be speaking about dairy production and cow slaughter in India. Okay. The presentation could also be called Jeev Dea and a Scientific Understanding of Issues Facing Cattle, or a Mathematical Understanding of Dairy Production, and you will see why. So I am a doctor from Canada, and if you're one of my friends from Canada watching this, you'll laugh at me because I'm using a little bit of an Indian accent. The reason is that uh, Indian people from India can understand my English much better that way. Um, also, I have a talk, habit of talking fast, so I'm going to try to slow down a little bit so people can understand me better. In Canada, I did my residency in family medicine, but mainly right now I do emergency medicine. I've also done a lot of addictions medicine, and I do some international health. Every year, I come to India and work in a medical camp called Bidra. It's in Kutch, Gujarat, and I work at this uh, trust hospital there um, for the past 10 years. And uh, also, I've done a little bit of work in uh, a couple of African countries. And I have a big interest on plant-based diet that means vegetarian vegan diet and health as well as um, just overall environmental issues and issues about compassion towards uh, other living uh, other living other life uh, basically okay so I want to start with a question and that question is what country in the world today 2015 has the number one beef export globally and which country in the world has approximately the number two production of raw materials for leather in the leather industry, which produces the most skin? Okay. And the answer to that question is India. Okay. India has the first largest uh, beef export in the world and a massive leather industry. And this sometimes uh, this surprises most people because India is a place where there's a lot of people who are vegetarian or believe that there's a, a religious or spiritual importance for the cow and whatnot. So how could this be? And here's a statistics from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and there's similar statistics from uh, from the Indian government, basically showing that in two 2012, at that point, India became the number one beef exporter in the world. Prior to that, it was you know Brazil, Australia, and the United. States uh, were higher than India, but India took over. And in the in the chart below, it shows that there's the increasing population of cattle in India. That means cows and cows and buffaloes actually, and uh, the increasing percentage of slaughter of the entire population per year. Now this is all the legal statistics. It doesn't count the illegal slaughter and whatnot of uh, these animals. Okay. So the traditional image of the cow in India is that it's sacred and spiritual. Um, it's associated with uh, Hindu uh, traditional beliefs. Um, but what's really happening in India right now is that there's this massive transportation of cattle. In so many cases, there are hundreds of cattle stuffed into very small spaces of trucks and transported one on top of each other or transported in other ways that are very tied, very tight and cruelly and transported for slaughter across straight lines or all kinds of places. And there are a lot of legal slaughterhouses in many states, and just as many, if not more so, illegal slaughterhouses that are all over India, including in the states where slaughter is completely banned. Okay. There's protesting against slaughter, mostly against the slaughter of cows, and much less against the slaughter of other animals. Um, but of course, the, the life of each animal is, is equally important. Okay. In politics, we can see that Indian cattle, uh, sometimes some political parties will try to protect uh, the cattle. But in the business news, they are showing that in this paper, there's a doubling of beef export in a mere three years, which is an extremely massive growth in any industry. So let's think about this problem, okay? This problem of immense suffering and immense uh, cruelty and death, okay? To understand any problem in the world, we must have a combination of ethics, science, uh, and that is the medical science, social science, economics, and uh, and research behind the, the whole thing. There should be uh, even a mathematical understanding, which I'm going to show you a little bit about. And we have to find the root of any problem. If we don't find the root of a problem, then we're not going to be able to find solutions solutions of the problem. And in so many cases, we don't find the root, but we find the problems that are secondary or tertiary or whatever. This means we often have to come overcome our own biases. 
and you know Indian cultures, Western cultures, everybody's extremely intelligent, but we have our biases. And in India, for example, there was this very rigid caste system that was there for thousands of years. And over the past 50, 60 years, we have mostly gotten rid of this system. It's a little bit still there. But this took a lot of effort to overcome the biases that were entrenched within the own culture, within our own culture. And this still applies for other problems. So we'll talk more about this. So let's look at some facts. The Indian cow, any cow in fact, has a lifespan of 20 to 25 years if you give it all the proper facilities for living. Okay, A cow can be made pregnant at the age of 1.5 years, 18 months. That uh, even earlier for some Western breeds of cows, but in India about that much, you can get it pregnant. That's just like a 13-year-old girl, a 12-year-old girl. It's still a child, but it can become pregnant. Milk production only starts after the delivery of a baby. That's all. I didn't fully, wasn't fully aware of this in, in when I was uh, many years ago, but that's the only time when milk production will start. And it will continue for about six to eight months in full force, okay, in full quantities, in large quantities, six to eight months, after which, naturally, it's just going to go to a very small quantity. It'll go like that for a few more months and then completely stop. Now, this varies from individual to individual, just like it does for humans. For humans, some people produce more milk, some less, some will go for a longer time. Even if they're trying to breastfeed, some will stop at an earlier time and some will go for a longer time. It's different from person to person. So cows have this individual variation, but roughly six to eight months of main production after that, very low production. Okay. After delivering the baby and producing milk, a cow can be again made pregnant at the three-month mark. Okay, And that's about the same for Western and Eastern cow breeds. Pregnancy lasts nine months, after which there will be another baby born, and full production of milk will resume at that point. Pregnancy occurs through two means. People have a farm for cows, and they have a bull that will make all of these cows pregnant, whether you have 100 or you have 10 cows, just you need one bull, and people just keep one bull to make them all pregnant. Or they use artificial insemination. And even in the villages of India, and I've been to many villages in India, in Kutch, for example, and a lot of the people there, are just local people having a few cows, are using artificial insemination. They know how to do it. Okay, so let's do the math. Okay, let's talk about the mathematics of this uh, system here. Let's say that I'm a farmer, I'm starting a new business, and I have 10 cows, and I keep a bull, okay, or use some other method for the artificial insemination method, okay. What I'm going to do if, if I'm starting a dairy business is I'm first going to get all of them pregnant, okay, and within nine months, I'm going to have 10 babies born, approximately five baby girls, five baby boys, okay, and for six to ten months, each of them will produce a large quantity of milk, and that's going to be my business. My total population went from 10 to 20 in this, in this system, so congratulations, it's my first year of business. Next year, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get them all pregnant while they're still milking, and I'm going to have another 10 births, population of 30. I'll do the same again the following year, and I'll have a population of 40. Okay, you see where this is going. Now the following year, I'm going to have the first five cows that were girls, the first females, I can get them pregnant. They're now old enough. In fact, I probably could have done it er one year earlier, but I'm being conservative in this video. So 15 births, my population is 55. Following year, another five female cows are ready to be pregnant. Population is now 75. I had 20 births this year. Next year, I have 25 births and I have a population of 100. So within six years or six cycles, let's say I may not be perfect getting everybody pregnant at the exact one year mark. Maybe it took uh, 13 months, 14 months, or 18 months, you know. But within approximately six to eight years, I'm going from a population of 10 to a population of 100. So 90 calves have been born. Out of that, 45 are approximately female and approximately 45 are male. Now, most of the males are automatically useless to me and to most people because in India, we don't use bulls for transportation or for farming anymore. That's a thing of the past. We are now using machines and cars and trucks and everything like that to for transport and for farming. Okay, And a farmer, and, and, and let's say that, uh, and I have, I have 45 females as well. So 
let's say as a farmer, the land I had was originally enough for about 30, a population of 30. Initially, I just had 10, so I had lots of space. But within two years, I filled up all that space. And maybe I'll push harder and I'll get a, a 40, fit 35 or 40, but I'm not going to be able to fit every single individual who has taken birth into the farm, into the land that I have. So what is this? This is what we call exponential population growth. We have very, very rapid population growth. We'll take a look at a few more facts now. There are over 1 billion cattle on the earth. Oh, this is cows and buffaloes, but mostly cows. Okay. And uh, I said it's about 1.2 billion total number. In India, there's approximately 300 million. In Indian terms, we say 30 crores. Okay, of population of cows and buffalo taken together. About two-thirds are cows and one-third are buffalo. The population right now is actually exceeding 32 crores or 320 million. But we'll just go for, uh, you know, the 30 crore number right now. There are more females than males. The reason is that there are more deaths of males. People don't need them. They send them to the slaughterhouse more. They don't feed them. They let them die of starvation much more often than they'll let the females die of any such cause. So the population of females is more. Now, every three to four years, the entire population will double. If perfectly on every year I made the, the females of pregnancy age, if I made them pregnant to get milk every, uh, perfectly every year, then in approximately 2.5 years or, you know, within three years, certainly the population is going to double. Three years, the population is going to double every time. But let's say I'm not perfect and I'm not doing it every single uh, year on the dot at 12 month mark. This will take a little longer. So every, let's say every three to four years in between that, the population of cows will double. Okay, uh, it's very fast in the West because you have this entire population of females and you reproduce them very quickly. You know, at 1.5 year mark, probably the entire population doubles. Remember, there's less males than there are females. From 300 million or 30 crores, I'm going to go to 60 crores, 600 million within four years. Right? In another four years, if I did it again, I'll be more than a billion. Now, how much land and water and food is there in India? In India, right now, we have cut down more than 80% of all forests. Animal grazing, other farming, cities, roads, lumber, these are all the causes. Even if we cut down the remaining 20%, there's no way that we can feed 60 crores or 60, 600 million cattle. There's no possibility of doing this. We have Panjrapurs. These are sanctuaries. Panjrapurs and Goshalas. These are sanctuaries that we keep, you know, un, you know, cows that are that are not well or too old or bulls that people don't use. But the maximum that we may keep in these Goshalas and Panjrapurs is probably one percent of the entire population. Maybe there's three million maximum. That's thirty lakhs, and probably even not that many. If you add all these Panjrapurs and Goshalas around India, there's probably not three million million or 30 lakhs worth of uh, population that are able to be kept. There's just not that much space or money or whatever. It's not a solution for 99% of them. And certainly if every three, four years you have another 300 million being born, there's no way you can keep all of these animals. Remember also that cattle drink about 50 to 100 liters of water per day. That's a lot of intake. Okay. And they eat a lot of food, far more food than a human would consume. So Basically, there's not enough food, water, or space for this endless population growth and this system of dairy production where you make every cow pregnant approximately every year, year and a half. You make them all pregnant. So as 300 million are born, the only way we can have space is that 300 million must die. Okay? That's the main, those, if you're going to take one point from this presentation, is that if you have 30 crores, 300 million, and you're making all the female pregnant for dairy almost every year and a half, then you're going to have 300 million deaths because there just isn't enough space for food. Now in India, maybe there's not 100% death, maybe the death rate is 90, you know, 98%, 95%. There's a small increase in population that's going on from year to year. If you look at the Indian and foreign statistics about Indian population of cattle and buffaloes and stuff like that, because we are, you know, we may not be killing exactly 100% of them. But if you're in the West, in Canada, US, there's an approximately 100% death rate. Here, it may be 90, 95, 97%. Okay. So, um, how 
how do they die? Okay, so there's legal slaughterhouses in many states, and the number of these are increasing. And the government recognizes that the the these cow farmers, uh, you know, they uh, need to increase their profit margin and survive and all these kind of things. So this is an extra source of profit, and uh, there's a lot of value, monetary value, money value in slaughter as well as export of these animal products. Okay. But just as much as legal slaughterhouses, there are probably the same amount, maybe even more, illegal slaughterhouses. All right. And throughout Gujarat, when I'm going to village to village, when I'm working in Kutch, I talk about these things with local people, and they're always telling me that there are so many of these illegal slaughterhouses, and they're just small operations that are temporarily here, temporarily there. They move them around. They're not fixed buildings or something like that. They just need some open land. They can do a whole bunch of slaughtering and whatever they need to do. Okay. A lot of people believe that, according to their religion, they should not slaughter a cow or a bull or somebody like that. So what they do is when there's a birth of a, of a, a male, and even many times for females, which they don't require, they don't have the space, they just tie them up to a post or to some place, and they don't feed them any water or any uh, food for about three, four days, and this animal will die. And so they say, okay, nature took this animal, God took this animal, but really, we have caused the death by tying the animal up and starving them. If there is starvation or a drought, lack of food, they will selectively feed the cows that are productive and not feed the animals that they don't need. So the older cows, the bulls, the males are, are not fed on an equal basis when it comes to a drought or something like that or with this massive population. And so they are let to die in that way. Many times there's illness. And if it's some animal that you require for business purposes, it's a cow that's producing, then we'll treat them. If it's not producing, there's less chance that they will treat them so they may die in that way. So there's a there's a high death rate as well. There's a local uh, goshala that that uh, produces milk where I uh, stay in Mulund in Bombay and they have amongst the babies there are about 100 babies born every year and they have a 60% death rate because they really don't uh, it doesn't matter for them if they die or not they want they don't want the increased population they only have a space for the 120 population that they have they get 100 births per year what do they do with them all so 60% of them die and the conditions are pretty bad in there too Okay. Also, people ab abandon them. You go to many villages and cities around India, you see these cows roaming around the street, and they're eating plastic and living in a filthy way, and getting sick of dying of plastic consumption, illness. Sometimes they're poisoned by farmers. If they're eating in the farmer's field, the farmer will lose their crop, so they will poison them, or they will catch them and sell them off, or they die of starvation. So these abandoned cows are a result of this dairy industry where people impregnate them every single year. You have too many animals, you just throw them out okay and in many cases the slaughter happens out of state so if it's banned in Gujarat they'll be slaughtered illegally or they'll be taken out of that state and put into a different state in order to slaughter them in Kutch where uh, I do a lot of this work the selling price for a male calf is only 500 rupees. There are so many births because they have a massive dairy industry and huge milk production there. So they have so many male uh, animals they don't know what to do with. Everybody is trying to get rid of them. And the price is only 500 rupees to sell on the black market. Okay, And what they do is they slaughter these calves. And uh, there's no law against uh, killing of lambs and goats. So they sell the meat of these animals as goat meat. And it just mixes with goat meat. And people, you know, nobody goes to check really the difference between what meat is being sold. Okay, So there's this huge industry in black market of... Uh, meat from the baby calves there and even females will go into that because people will have overpopulation of females and that's the way a lot of these street cows they disappear and end up into these illegal slaughterhouses too so looking at the root of the problem it's not slaughter that is the, the cause. It's the repeated pregnancy over and over again in this massive population growth that is actually the problem. And that's from the dairy industry. Here's this newspaper artic article again. This is from 2012. And it says that buffalo meat, uh, due to increase in buffalo meat, within three years, there's a double of buffalo, of beef exports just from buffalo meat. Okay? And... 
So for buffaloes, who cares? Everybody's always talking about protecting cows because somehow there's more of a reverence for cows. But the life of a buffalo is of equal importance in this process. And when we talk about the total population that we are breeding for milk, uh, one third of it is, cow, uh, is buffaloes and two thirds are cows. So there's about uh, 10 crores of buffaloes and 20 crores of cows that almost every year we are making pregnant and they have a baby and you have this population growth. Okay, there's these Panjapurs or Goshalas. We talked about the fact that they are full and there's not enough space for this exponential population growth. A lot of times, some of them are good, but a lot of them are very crowded and very dirty. And even when a, ca a calf is born, let's say a male calf, the farmer does not need this male calf. They take the calf away and they put it in this Panjapur and they save the life of the calf. But it's not still uh, a good thing because the calf wants to stay with his mother and the mother wants to stay with his calf. They have a huge bond and attachment with each other. And when we separate them, we cause a lot of suffering to both of them. So again, this is not a perfect solution, just taking you know calves and putting in the Panjapur. And some people say we're just not utilizing all of these extra animals. We could use them in the farm, we could use their dung, we can use the urine for Ayurvedic medicines or other purposes like that. But the truth is that even if you had a few thousand cows, that will produce enough urine for all the Ayurvedic medicines in all of India because they're producing urine all the time, large quantities, and we don't need that that much for the medicine purposes. That's small quantities only that we need. And for the cow dung also, most, you know, some people use for cooking or for building materials or for making the flooring. It does some nice jobs, but we don't need an unlimited amount. A few million cattle can probably do the job or a few hundred thousand, a few lakhs or a one, two crores, who knows, can produce all of this material for, for the entire India. And you don't have to make the cow pregnant every year to get cow dung. That happens just from feeding the cow. It's only dairy that you need to make pregnant every year in order to get the milk product. So we see the street cows in India eating garbage that's a result of this dairy industry as well. And um, okay, um, in many cases, these street cows, according to the laws of big cities, they used to roam around, but the laws came in saying that they have to be cleared. You can't have cows roaming around Bombay, which is a modern, cosmopolitan, busy city with traffic. So that and other such cities, they round up the cows and they take them out, and those cows, they all get slaughtered as well. Okay. So basically the main point is that 300 million are born, 30 crores are born every three to four years, and 30 crores must die, okay, approximately. And there's not enough space for endless population growth. For one to be born, another must die. And we can't blame the entire process on the slaughtering industry. That's not the source of the problem. That's the end result. But the root cause the root cause is repeated pregnancy and exponential population growth. Even if we closed every single slaughterhouse, if every slaughterhouse was to be closed tomorrow, all of these cows would die of another method. All of the bulls would die of another method. People will tie them up. People will let them go abandoned in the street. People will illegally slaughter. Even if you, you know, people will t uh, let them starve to death. People will let them be sick and die from their overpopulation they will die of these other methods which are equally painful and equally cruel as slaughtering. It's simply because we do this uh, pregnancy every year for the dairy industry. So that's really the main cause of all of this.